It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date is Wednesday, the 8th of July, and uh, I'll dive straight into my personal update. I'm very excited to say that I visited a bookstore this week. Um, actually, yesterday went into town because the restrictions on lockdown are lifting up quite considerably in Britain. Um for how long, who knows, but I was able to go into the bookstore where I normally sit down and and write my words, although the cafe wasn't open, which was a shame, but I figured after being confined and quarantined for the best part of nearly four months, it was probably, (laughs) it was was interesting going back into town and just seeing, seeing how people have responded to being so insular. There were a lot of people that were obviously being careful, keeping their distance, um, surprisingly few people with masks on I had a mask on just because I was in a crowded place and I had no idea what to expect and the last thing I want to do is not be prepared um and I I I personally think it's just considerable well you can it's considering of other people um to wear one so why the hell not um but yeah it was it was interesting going around seeing the the results of a zombie apocalypse as things are starting to 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 ease up but it just sucks that I couldn't sit down at my normal table and, and have my latte and you know live life as as I want to but you know, a, a vaccine will come, things will ease up, and then we'll move on. Um, I have also been chipping away at When Winter Comes, book two, or episode two, I should say. Uh, episode one, still ticking along, getting a nice sort of regular trickle of sales. Um, had quite a lot of pre-orders for book two, which I'm very, very uh, happy about. And yeah, just in edits, I'm getting good beta feedback, good uh, feedback from my ARC reviewers, from my um, from my patrons, And looking forward to getting episode two out, what will be next week, next Wednesday, when this airs, um, and then pretty much straight into work on (laughs) episode three. It's all going very, very fast. I may have some regrets, but I I work best under under pressure, so let's let's, let's keep pushing. For those interested, I thought this was a a topic that's probably worth bringing up, is that on last week's episode of, or this week's episode, last week, a few days ago, uh, the episode of the Next Level Authors podcast, which I do every week with Sasha Black, uh, I asked the question, how do you defeat imposter syndrome? And I know this is quite a a hot topic for a lot of writers and a lot of people do struggle with imposter syndrome and just trying to basically put the words out into the world and all that kind of good stuff. So for about half an hour, we discuss our individual approaches to how we conquer and defeat imposter syndrome or do our best to try and defeat imposter syndrome. So if anyone does suffer from that, it's definitely worth going over to the Next Level Authors podcast and checking that out. In great writer share news, there are some big changes coming to the podcast, which I'm going to tease because I am a big tease and I'm not going to say much more. But I do, I, I, I'm I, at a point where there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I'm very, very excited. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting things rolling that I've been wanting to get rolling for a little while and I'm very, very pleased with how they're going. And let's just say that in a couple of months' time, there'll be a big change that won't affect the the podcast too much. It won't affect the sort of types of interview you're expecting. It won't, it, it won't affect any of that, but it's just a lot of stuff in the background that will, number one, help me, but number two, I think, bring an extra level of uh, excellence <laughs> to what's an already an amazing podcast, if I do say so myself. So keep tuned for that because I'm very excited for that. So I'm just I'm just working on getting a lot of that in place at the minute. Today's guest is Gemma Amor, who is a Bram Stoker nominated writer of horror. Uh, she is also a podcaster, an illustrator, basically a creator at heart. And she's someone who I came across her book, White Pines, um, probably about two, two, three months ago. And I mentioned this in the interview, but I, I checked out the prologue just to get a feel for the book. And I wasn't planning on reading it straight away, but it's one of those books that kind of swept me away and I just got lost in the story, which, you know, is, is what you want as an author. So I was very, very excited to reach out and get Gemma on the show and just talk to her about all of her process and everything she's working on. Um, and we dive quite deeply into uh, one thing that I absolutely was 
very, very fascinated with because I've seen this work for some people. I've seen this not work for other people. But Gemma actually funded the production and publication of uh, White Pines through Kickstarter. So she set up a Kickstarter and basically got all the funding that she wanted for the audiobook, the cover, everything else before she you know, finished the book, um, which I think is it's a really interesting avenue to go down. It's something that I've always wanted to explore myself. But it seems like quite I, I guess it's not too much of a risk because ultimately if you're publishing yourself you're already putting you know money on the line but this way you're almost guaranteeing up front that you've got some kind of interest before you write the book um so it's very, very interesting we dive into the mechanics of that we talk into we talk deeper into why Gemma likes to keep things simple and we talk generally about the joy of creation and why you don't necessarily have to restrict yourself to one particular medium uh, and how you can find that joy in all different mediums or different facets of the creation process um, so stick around for that. No new patrons this week, but for as little as a dollar a month, you can go over to www.patreon.com forward slash great writer share and get a load of extra goodies, a load of good bonus stuff. You can get early ad free access to episodes before they air anywhere else. You can get access into the Slack group and join our other patrons over there and get access as well to the Great Writers Learn mini series, which is currently live in the group itself. Um, so there are loads of different bonuses you can get involved in and you can get access to that for as little as $1 a month. So check it out. And now, without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one and the only Miss Gemma Amore. Enjoy. Gemma Amore is a Bram Stoker Award-nominated horror fiction author, podcaster, illustrator and voice actor based in the UK. Her books include Cruel Works of Nature, the award-nominated Dear Laura, White Pines, Until the Score is Paid. She's also the co-creator, writer, and the voice actor for horror comedy podcast, Calling Darkness, starring Kate Sigel. Gemma's stories feature on the No Sleep podcast, Shadows at the Door, Creepy, and the Grey Rooms podcast. You can find her in a number of horror anthologies too. Gemma, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. No problem. I wanted to dive straight in to uh, basically give my audience a little bit of a, a view of who you are, just in case they aren't aware. And uh, what I normally do is ask people just to give a little bit of a, a rounded overview of what got them into writing. But something that particularly piqued my interest when I read it about you is something that we both got in common, it seems, in that Cujo had quite a major influence on you starting out. So did you want to go a little bit into the story behind Cujo? Yeah, um, it's interesting because I think... Um, about a year ago, I did uh, an article. I was interviewed for an article on Cemetery Dance's website um, called My First Fright, where I wrote about uh, my love of Cujo, and, and it was my introduction to Stephen King. And uh, I've since read that interview back um, and cringed several times <laughs> at some of the answers I've given, uh, just because it just seemed quite like a, a blasé, uh, the way I spoke about the master of horror and stuff. So... It's good to have an opportunity to, well, here to clarify you go, clear exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I mean, I've been uh, reading and avid reader and, and writing for most of my life. I think I began writing as a child, as many of us have. And um, I sort of embraced horror as a teenager through the, the kind of highly accessible point horror books and um, the R.L. Stein Goosebump books and, you know, the perfect sort of young adult fiction. But it wasn't until, um, well, I, I then kind of studied classical literature at university and came across the kind of the Charlotte Perkins Gilmans and the Shirley Jacksons. And uh, I, I came to horror from a more traditional route. Um, but it wasn't until my 20s that I started reading Stephen King. And I started reading Stephen King because I was traveling and I was in India and I was in Mumbai, I believe. And uh, I was walking around or is it Delhi? No, I think it was Delhi. Um, I was walking around and uh, it's a, it's a massive city and there's an awful lot going on. It's, it's a, it's a bit of a sensory overload. In fact, India in, in itself is, is a huge experience. Mm. And I was looking for a quiet place to go to read a book, but I didn't have a book. I'd finished reading my own book and, um, the streets of Delhi have got, uh, book stalls kind of lining the pavement. And these are just, uh, blankets laid out on the ground or bits of plastic with books kind of stacked up in piles. Um, and I was looking at, uh, one of these bookstalls and the only book I could see written in, in English was Stephen King's Cujo and I'd never read a Stephen King novel before. And I bought this novel 
uh, for a couple of rupees and it had a wonderful kind of quite sort of 80s style cover to it um, and I took it off to a little coffee shop and I started reading and I just couldn't put it down um, and I speak to people regularly about my love for this book because <laughs> for me it was one of the first examples of um, kind of mainstream horror that was character driven um, and the character in Cujo was such a fascinating one. The lead character is the, is the role of, a, you know, she's a mother and she's not only a mother, she's an adulterous mother. She's an adulterous mother kind of holding on to a, a grim secret. And that is secret is her own guilt and her infidelity. Uh, and on top of that, she's then thrown into this incredibly dangerous situation where her son's life is at risk as well as her own. Um, in the face of, it's actually quite a simple book. It's it's got a very simple premise. It's it's you know, good versus bad. Except you kind of you find yourself sympathising with the bad entity <laughs> Cujo because Cujo's actually sick, um, and you the way it's written, you see snippets of the book from different perspectives. You see it from the perspective of Cujo. You see it from his eyes. You see it from the perspective of the mother. Um, I forget what her name is. Um, this moment but it's just a fascinatingly simple but very well written premise um and it's incredibly engaging and it's obviously you know it the the tension ratchets up like the 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 plot the the, the sorry i'm stumbling it's going to get <laughs> out. I'll try again the the idea of having most of the action set in a single place and that single place being a hot stuffy car on a summer's day with the windows rolled up Mm. Um, with no chance of escape is incredibly effective and claustrophobic and I just I really responded to it very well I, I kind of raced through the book I, I devoured it and then I went off um, and when I got back from my travels I bought pretty much every single book I could find of his <laughs> and read read the entire back catalogue with the exception of the Dark Tower series which I still haven't read yet interesting I've um, literally just finished that myself have you and I'm mm. saving it for when I actually can read again mm. because my concentration is a bit shot to pieces at the moment <laughs> um but yeah so that was my first encounter of, of the king um and it stayed with me and it gave me a genuine appreciation for writing a scary story from the perspective of a well-rounded well-developed character um and i think that's something that stayed with me ever since um with my own work as well mm. no i definitely agree it's it's such a simple premise and to carry it forward for that volume of pages and still deliver a story that that grips you that has its own corners that it still twists is is something incredibly impressive and you know we could spend ages going on about how incredible Stephen King can be in some of his books um but what were the what were the particular lessons what were the feelings that you took from that book that then propelled you into your own horror and and the journey that started there I think simplicity was the key for me actually and I think um so when you read Cujo, it reads very much like it could just, you, you could quite easily have read that as a short story. And it, it read like a short story that had been expanded upon and developed and, and roundly developed into, a, I think, what is now the perfect length of a novel. Um, and so for me, throughout my kind of uh, early writing life, I won't call it a writing career because it hasn't been a career until the last couple of years, but I've been writing or trying to write for most of my life since I was a child and I was never really able to finish anything. I had all the enthusiasm, I had all the words, I would sit down and put the work in but I was never able to finish a project or, or get to any sense of completion with it because I just didn't really know how to write a book. Um, and then one of the things I realised about uh, writing is that you can make life easier for yourself as a writer by making things very very simple um and one of the ways i realized that is by reading stephen king's short story collections as well and so things like skeleton crew was a huge influence for me and i read i read stories like the langoliers um and and just realized that you can write something as we said, based on a simple premise, but it doesn't actually have to be a long opus either. You can you can write a damn good, compelling story in five, six, seven thousand words, ten thousand words at a push. So the way it influenced my writing was by taking me back to basics, and I start I stopped trying to write books and novels, and I started focusing on writing short stories. 
And I finally found at the age of 30, whatever it was, that after years and years and years of trying, I had finished something. And that sense of accomplishment was incredible. And I sent that story off um, to the No Sleep podcast and it was accepted. And that pretty much launched my kind of current writing career. So, yeah, I think um, simplicity was the, the key ingredient for me. Just have have an idea, make it a strong idea, keep it simple. Um, and that's, again, that's carried me through um, to even when it comes to writing a book. Um, yeah. That seems really contrary to a lot of direction, that I guess, people um early on in their in their career would choose to go because i think there tends to be a leniency towards creating the big novel the the big story that you really want to sell you can push through all the publishers that that seems to be the route that people at least begin with um i love this idea of peeling all that back and just going through into a short story i mean at that point had you had you completed any large works in any capacity before you finish a short story I would say I probably had about 10 or 11 and I still have um, unfinished manuscripts Mm. all around the 30,000 to 40,000 word mark. Um, And they would all peter to a a horrible, you know, they'd peter out at that sort of point. And I'd I'd get so embroiled in self-editing and going back over and trying to make Mm. sense of it. And I'd run out of momentum and I couldn't visualize where the story was going Um, and also because I worked, you know, and I worked full time like many of us do and having any energy to kind of apply yourself to writing a book outside of working an eight hour day. And then if you've got children or anything on top of that is, is nigh on impossible. Mm. So for me, stripping it back to the very basics, to small word counts, to simple ideas was pretty much the only way I could move forward as a writer at that point in my life. Um, Mm. And it worked. You know, it, it, I think what you need, particularly in the early days of your kind of career, if you are looking to make it a career, is uh, you need a boost. You need a success story. And even if that success story is typing the end on something for the first time ever, um, or, or having something that you can actually send off and submit to somebody, rather than writing yourself into a hole and never succeeding in finishing anything. So... Um, I would say that I mean I've I've I'm not sort of a trained writer. I, I studied English literature at university, but I didn't study creative writing. I've n- no one's ever really sat down and told me how to write or write a book. I've kind of muddled through and figured most of it out for myself because writing is a personal experience, and mm. you should write for yourself at all times. And I found that I regained my joy and my love of the craft by sticking to short stories. And I still do. And I still, I still bash out a short story, you know, probably one or two a month um, as a way of keeping my brain nimble and keeping the words flowing. And I will quite happily take a break from a bigger project and just go off and indulge any idea that pops up in my head, because I think it's all grist for the mill. And it's, it's like, um, it's like exercise to me. Like you, 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 go to the gym every day and if you stop going you notice it you feel it you you feel the effect on your body and I think your brain is a very similar organ a similar muscle and it needs regular exercising um and discipline in the area at which you want to succeed so short stories is another way of me keeping on top of my my skill and my craft and it's such an underrated art form I mean that there are a lot of parallels I'm drawing from from my own journey and yours in that my my first introduction into me wanting to write was a Stephen King short story collection and I I entered through everything's eventual um mm. not sure if you read that one but some fantastic I have, stories yeah, yeah. In there. yeah absolutely yeah. brilliant um and from that sprang a number of short stories and I think a lot of people don't I mean as I said a lot of people tend to jump straight into the deep end as opposed to trying these little snippets of short stories and obviously you you wrote the end for for that short story went on to the no sleep podcast and since then, you've had a slew of short stories that have been published on loads of different places across the, the internet and podcasts and whatnot. How, how has that journey gone for you in terms of um, how have you found the places to submit? Were you quite deliberate in who you were approaching or was it a case of just canvassing where you could try and get some short stories out there? I mean, I mean for me, I have to put my hands up and say I, I wouldn't be here were it not for a hefty dose of luck. Um, <laughs> and for for the wonderful people at the no sleep podcast so i um i began writing properly and writing full time and dedicating myself to it 
um, because I was made redundant from two jobs in a row, two jobs in succession. And um, I also wasn't very well. And I'm very open about the fact that I, I struggled a lot with my mental health. Um, and I was, I was quite a poorly person. So I found myself with a lot of time on my hands um, uh, and a desperate need to get a lot of the things in my head out on paper as a way of helping me to untangle my thoughts. Um, and the way I started doing that was through writing these short stories. Um, and at, at the same time that I was made redundant, um, I, I was obviously at home a lot. I spent a lot of time by myself and I, I came across the No Sleep podcast and thought, well, why not? So it was the first short story I wrote and finished and I sent it off and it was accepted. Um, and I built up a relationship with the editors there um, quite quickly um, and with the showrunner. And I've been so, so lucky in their support. They've been, um, David Cummings is the show, showrunner, um, has been a massive, massive mentor and supporter of my work. Um, and it's driven me forward. And it was th me through meeting them, I met my first publisher, it was an indie publisher called Haunted House Publishing. I then went on to make connections and friends. Um, and it's just, it's just grown from there. And, I, and, and podcasts all know each other as well. So mm. um, all of those podcasts are kind of connected through, through mutual people who know mutual people. And the word spreads um, and you build up relationships and, and a reputation as well. So, yeah, my, my kind of podcast journey has been... Um, very lucky and I'm an organic and I'm it's not that I sort of sit down and go through a list and hammer out submissions in fact I'm not actually I don't actually submit to a lot of places I have to say um mostly because I don't have time and I probably need to make more time for it because I'm I'm limiting I think my audience a little bit at the moment but I also found a home that I'm comfortable with you know I'm comfortable mm. with writing short stories for the show um, they're very um, accommodating about the fact that I then go off and publish those short stories um, in in my own short story collections. Um, yeah, so it's it's more of a case of I think as a writer I've found people that I like to work with, um, and that isn't to say that I shouldn't submit to other publications and find other people that I would also you know be a good fit for. But for now, it works for me, and I'm I'm very happy and very grateful for the support that I've had that sort of pushed me this far, um, mm. as well. One thing I absolutely love about your journey and and the brand that you're building around yourself is that you don't you don't seem to tie yourself down to any particular one medium or art form. Um, I think in in terms of the research that I was looking up on you, you obviously are a writer, you're a podcaster, and you do your your audio dramas, uh, Calling Darkness. You're an illustrator, you're a voice actor, you, you play around with all these different mediums. What, mm. do you, what does the term artist mean to you specifically? And what is it mm. you're trying to achieve with, with your creativity? Um, I don't really think I'm trying to achieve anything. I think the reason I flit around and, and try and get involved in as many things as possible is pro it's probably an element of uh, mania going on there. Because <laughs> my, my brain is quite a frantic beast sometimes and I... I find peace through creativity. So I find I slow down if I apply myself to something creative. Um, I, you know, and I, I've always been that way. I've always had quite a lot of energy that, that needed to go somewhere. And I can't think of anything better than creating stuff. Um, and then the joy it gives me when I see other people enjoying what I create is, is enormous. So I don't, I don't really have, I do have a business head and I do have, um, an understanding and appreciation of marketing and, and business and how it works. But the main reason I create is for me. Um, it gives me peace. It, it stills my brain. It lets me sleep. I enjoy it. It makes me happy. Um, and I probably will do it for the rest of my life. And until my fingers fall off, you know, I, I don't ever plan on retiring. This is my life. Um, and I have to write, I have to create. If I don't, I'm very miserable. And, and my husband will tell you I'm, I'm an awful <laughs> person to live with if I'm not allowed to, to just be myself. So um, I think in terms of what being an artist means to me, again, I don't see, I'm, I'm quite a simple person. Like a simplicity, if, if I had a brand word or a brand statement, it would be simplicity or I'm simple. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't. 
I don't tend to think about stuff like that, if that makes sense. Mm. I don't I don't tend to think about the grander scheme of things or the, the big words or the, the, the vision. I literally just sit down every day and plug away and that's me and I'm happy doing that. Um, and I was saying, uh, I sort of dabbled in a, in a tweet thread the other day about um, how to keep sane as a writer and sort of things to do to protect your mental health and particularly with social media. And one of the things I said in that thread was that I, I spend a lot of time throwing things at the wall to see what sticks <laughs> and some things slide off and some things stick and I keep doing the things that stick. Um, so, you know, there's probably other places that I'd like to explore. I'd love to explore screenwriting. I'm, I'm investigating that at the moment. Nice. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, amateur dramatics. I used to, I studied drama at university as well. I did a bit of acting in my time. So who knows? There's, there's a massive world out there and life is very short. And I just feel like we should try our utmost to enjoy it in all the ways possible. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of, I like, I like having lots of strings to my bow. And, and one thing my mum always said to me when I was a kid is, is don't put all your eggs in one basket, uh, which um, I think there's a certain amount of wisdom to that as well. But also it can be something to think about in terms of not overextending yourself. And there is a certain amount of truth to the expression that sometimes you should also stay in your lane. Um, so I try not, I try to make, you know, writing is my main, it's my job. If somebody asked me what I, what I do for a living, I would say I was an author or I was a writer or whatever the term is that people use. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't say I was a voice actor. I wouldn't say I was an illustrator or a podcaster. I would say first and foremost, I'm a writer, but I do all those other things as well. And springing this back into simplicity as well, which is going to also be a theme of this conversation, it seems in reading white pines which i believe i tweeted you not long after i started reading white pines um and gave you yeah. probably one of the biggest compliments i could give which was i was planning <laughs> on jumping into a different book yes i then, remember that <laughs> and then a friend told me to download white pines which i did i read the prologue just to get a little taste of what it was all about and ended up forsaking the other book to finish reading <laughs> white pines um, that makes me very happy <laughs> no it was honestly a, a fantastic book i loved the premise of it I think the delivery was spot on and bringing this back to simplicity there. I, I, there's no other way to say it. It's a very, it's a very clean story. It's a very simple idea that's just executed with um, an elegance that is, is quite rarely seen in, in contemporary horror from, from at least some of the stuff that I've been reading. Um, but I'd love to go a little bit into the journey of white pines because one thing that I'm fascinated about um, and something that I've, I guess had in the peripheries of my mind as potentially playing around with at some point, but never seen it executed like you did is you you ran the funding for that through kickstarter do you want to give just a little bit of a background about what that was and and how you approached using kickstarter to fund some of the the white pines production yeah so i mean i i'd never i'd never used kickstarter before i'd never fundraised for anything before um and it was in the i was a, i was just going into the second year of being a full-time writer and what I needed was enough money to produce a book that I considered was good enough quality off of my own back. So, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of giving birth to a book and some people do it uh, the more old fashioned way where they sit down and they write a jolly good book and they send it off and they get agent representation and then they get traditionally published. And I, I am in, you know, I've never criticised that approach at all. And, and I've also started investigating that possibility for my own work moving forward. But one of the, the big drawbacks to traditional publishing, particularly for a new writer, was how long it takes to get from book to shelf, if that makes sense. How long mm. it takes to get anything out there. Um, and and it, indeed, whether or not you actually ever will, you know, there's the querying journey with agents is is a long and arduous one for many, many people. And it can take a number of years to even get a request for a full manuscript. Um, and and there's no guarantee even if that happens that your book will end up anywhere. And even if it does, that it will be a hit. And there's just there's so many different parts to that journey that for me at that point in my life, all I really wanted to do in, you know, in the second year of my, my career as a writer was to just write a good book and get it out there as quickly as possible so that people could read it. And then I could move on to the next project. 
And I don't mean that I wanted to rush anything or just, you know, churn out anything and, and get it out as quickly as possible for the sake of it. I just knew that for me and how quickly I can write, I wanted a quick turnaround in terms of, of publication for the book. And I was fairly confident that I could promote it myself enough to build up a readership. And I'd already built up a fairly decent sort of core audience of readers um, who were very happy to sort of talk about my work and spread the word. And word of mouth marketing is, is gold, basically, when you're a writer. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had a year of that behind me. I had a year of um, writing stories for no sleep. And I had a, a small and loyal reader base. And I just thought, well, why don't I appeal to that reader base to help me kind of pre-fund the next book so that I could produce something of high quality, but in a reasonably short space of time. Um, and so I launched the Kickstarter and within two months it was funded. I think it was uh, it was sort of 180% of target. So I was very relieved. Um, and then that meant that I could go off and hire a decent book cover artist uh, who was Keelan Patrick Burke, the very talented Keelan Patrick Burke um, with his uh, book cover design company. Um, and yeah, I just had that that safety, that financial safety to kind of produce something of decent quality and, and to, to get an editor on board to help me with story developments. Um, and then obviously to have enough money to then mail the book out to readers at the end of the process, which I still haven't got to yet, mostly because just as I finished the book, the pandemic hit. <laughs> so post office. Uh, but the books are coming. The, the e-books have all gone out. Mm. Um, how, and how I found it, I found it for me again, as a fairly new writer and going back to that idea of confidence and needing a boost and needing a little bit of a success story to kind of drive you through a project because writing a book can sometimes be like wading through treacle and, and you feel all the feelings and all the emotions and you lose motivation so easily um, that having that little boost is really important. Um, and just the sheer fact that so many people had actually supported the book up front and paid for it on the basis of the prologue, um, which I also narrated so they could hear a sample of it being narrated. Just the, just the fact that they had thrown money in the direction of my writing on the basis of a sample of it was such a huge confidence booster for me um, that it really did help drive me through. And it also gave me such a huge level of accountability that yes. I knew I had to deliver. I couldn't fail. I couldn't give up. I couldn't just run off with the money. There has to be a finished product at the end of this. And so many books fall down, I think, particularly mine in the past, because there's been no accountability and there's been no deadline. Um, and that's what a, a pre-funded project gives you through Kickstarter. Um, I'm not saying I would do it again. I think <laughs> I would probably, especially not in the current climate, I think asking people for money and funding at the moment is very tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very glad I did it. And I, and I feel quite happy with how the book came out even though it took a very long time <laughs> to write. And it was, an, it was an awful, it was a bugger of a book to write, but I'm happy with the end product. So, and I'm glad you liked it as well. No, it was, it was genuinely fantastic. I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember whether I'm pretty sure I put up a review. If I haven't, I definitely will for you. Um, one, one thing I absolutely love about that is obviously the fact that, like you mentioned, in running a Kickstarter, you, you can end up with a pre-funded book, which for a lot of writers, the difficulty is writing a book that you're going to put into a market that you're not sure whether or not will sell. So there's mm. a lot of the pushing the boulder uphill before you can get it over to the other side. Whereas obviously, like you say, with this, there's an element of not that the heavy lifting is done, but that a big weight of the validation of knowing whether or not your book is going to go ahead is taken from you. What were some of the challenges in terms of delivering that book? Because I'm guessing um, there was a certain level of expectation from probably yourself yeah. to make sure you're delivering to these people who have taken that gamble and put that that risk yeah. that their, their financial backing for you before they've seen the product. What were what were some of the challenges with that? I would say that was probably the biggest challenge for me um, in in terms of meeting the expectations of people that had pledged their money and their support to you. So when you write a book and you put it out there normally if people buy it then that's brilliant and that's obviously the end game but if people don't buy it then that's because they've probably never heard of you or it's just not their cup of tea but when somebody has invested in you then they expect a certain level of product 
for their money, which is completely right. Um, and it's quite an odd relationship to have with your readers to have them waiting on your stuff uh, before you've even written it. So uh, the weight of expectation combined with the weight of expectations that I sort of put upon myself as well, I have, I hold myself to quite high standards and probably too high standards really um, sometimes um, in terms of how obsessive I get over certain details and things. And it sometimes can interfere with the writing process. You can get overwhelmed with thinking about all those people sat there waiting for you to deliver the book. Um, you have to learn how to separate yourself off from that and just focus on the writing and not get too bogged down by whether or not somebody will like it once you've written it. You can't think like that. You have to just remember that you write for yourself first and foremost, and that's why you do it, um, and try and deliver the best quality product that you possibly can and then generally you find that people are very receptive to it if if you've done your you know I hate that expression do your best because it's sounds patronizing <laughs> but it really is it's all you can do as a writer is just try your damnedness to like produce the best quality story you possibly can and one from the heart as well and uh I kind of I tend to pour myself into everything I write um which I might not necessarily recommend because <laughs> it can be very exhausting. And what tends to happen at the end of a book when I finish one is that I then fall over and collapse and die uh, and have a bit of a meltdown for a few days. And it takes me a good couple of weeks to recover from the emotional impact of finishing that story because I'm a little, you know, sensitive flower. <laughs> and, um, so the difficulties for me in delivering the book were where there were some emotional challenges around making, you know, making sure I didn't worry too much about whether or not what I was doing was any good. That's a constant worry anyway, as a creative. Um, but also technically this book for me is interesting. We were talking about simplicity and, and you were saying that it's quite a simple concept um, executed in a good way and and I actually found that out of everything I've written this so far up until the book that I'm writing at the moment anyway hmm. was the most complicated thing I think I'd ever tried to write and for that reason I rewrote the damn thing about four or five times I think I went through seven drafts of it in the end um, including a 10,000 the first 10,000 words I wrote of the book I just scrapped and threw away and started again <laughs> which hurt, hurt quite a lot but you have I to bet. do that sometimes uh, and it changed so it started out as a book it was in a nondescript american town um i wanted to sort of an all i wanted an almost appalachian feel to it um and as i was writing it 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 was based around a town um called blue ridge and, and there was a reporter from a newspaper called the blue ridge herald and it was set in the eight, no, in the nineties. Um, and as I was writing it, I realised I didn't have a good enough understanding or vision of the place I was writing about to make mm -hmm. it authentic. And what I was writing was really weak and really flabby, and the characters weren't very interesting. And I couldn't get a fix on the setting and the environment. And the the, the writing just wandered around all over the place. And so I did a lot of really hard thinking. Um, and I sacrificed that draft and I sat down and I was talking to my husband about the dilemma I had. And the dilemma I had was that, um, so for anybody that hasn't read the book, it's about a town called White Pines, which disappears one day and it takes all its inhabitants, its residents with it. And the main problem I had with that is that if a town were to disappear in the modern day world, people would notice and people would be talking about it and it would be big news. Um, and I needed to place the town of White Pines in an isolated spot so that that wasn't an issue because the whole premise of the book was that nobody talks about it. Nobody um, talks widely about this entire community that's just vanished off the face of the earth. And why not? And th that the idea of mystery surrounding that was only possible if the town was somewhere very remote to begin with. So I started uh, looking at islands and my husband uh, in the course of conversation, mentioned a small island um, on the coast of Scotland, the Highlands, called Anthrax Island, where the government did military testing in the Second World War, uh, then experimented with anthrax spores. And the more I researched 
the island and the more I researched the surrounding area and realised how beautiful it was, the more I realised that I could write a book and have a more authentic voice if it was set a little bit closer to home for me. Um, And I went up there and I did a lot of research and I drove around for two or three days and and absorbed a lot of the atmosphere and spoke to some of the people and and then the story just kind of wrote itself from there so I think once I'd found my home like you need to find a book needs a home and once I'd Mm. found my home the writing process became a hell of a lot easier that being said I still went through so many multiple different drafts because I was trying to achieve a bit too much I think perhaps in one book um there was a there's a folk horror thread there's a cult thread there's a kind of um alternate reality thread there's a a relationship drama thread there's a body horror thread there's there's a lot going on and it took an awful lot of work and a lot of tries to try and get it to weave together in a way that was even remotely feasible or readable um so for me actually it, it wasn't a very simple book to write i kind of preach about simplicity earlier on and I totally just completely like (laughs) been a complete hypocrite in the course of this conversation uh but actually if anything it's brought home to me that perhaps I am more comfortable sticking with a simpler concept Mm -hmm. than some vast cosmic uh multi-dimensional thing which I'm not entirely sure what white pines actually even is um it's, it's very genre fluid um but yeah, it was, it taught me, I would say out of everything I've written, that book taught me more about writing and how to write a book than anything else I've done so far. And I will take those lessons forward with the next book, which is even bigger concept, <laughs> even mm. more ridiculous. So, <laughs> and uh, bringing this back a little bit to what we were saying at the beginning about the struggles of reaching the end with a larger product. How did it feel to reach the end with White Pines? It was exhausting. It was actually exhausting. And and the deadline kept creeping back and I kept pushing it back and pushing it back because I just wasn't ready to finish. Um, And in the end, I actually uh, I actually took myself off to a hotel for two nights so that I could finish because uh, writing at home with a family is quite difficult. And the end of a book is for me personally, it's an incredibly insular experience because you are not only finishing the story, but you're simultaneously tying off every single narrative thread you're making sure your character is uh given a good send-off that you haven't forgotten anything you're doing all your grammatical and type you know typo checks and your line edits it's it's a huge undertaking finishing (laughs) a book so i went away somewhere very very quiet um and got room service for a couple of days and just just put my head into it completely uh and it's exhausting it's absolutely exhausting finishing a book but it's it's a pretty good feeling typing the end on something uh for about a day and then you have the second wave of angst will anyone actually like this book (laughs) which is (laughs) which is the next phase of like um paranoia that you experience as a writer on a kind of daily basis i've done this thing i'm really happy with it what if nobody else likes it um so it's always a very it's a very emotional journey it's a very up and down journey and it's a very very exhausting journey um and i again i probably put way too much of myself into the process of writing a book and it always it just kills me off and i'm useless for for weeks afterwards and then it starts to come back slowly and then i start the whole thing all over again because <laughs> i'm a sadist <laughs> makes you wonder why we do it <laughs> exactly like why did, because it's but this is it it's for me it's a compulsion i am compelled yeah. and if i don't do it i'm miserable um and if i do do it i'm fairly miserable while i'm doing it as well but um but you do it's there's a very unique and specific sort of joy in giving birth to a book and mm-hmm. i always use the the analogy of giving birth because it feels like that i've given birth physically to my child and this is a different form of it, but it feels very similar in a lot of ways. And you are insanely protective over your words when they come out. Um, and, and you want it to, to go off and, and achieve and you want people to like it. Um, it's, it's the most, uh, it's like creating music. It's like any art form. You're putting yourself out there on a platter for people to kind of taste. And if they don't like the taste of you, then that's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> so, yeah. How do you deal with criticism? Um, 
Um, I, well, for one thing, I stay away from reviews now. I used to obsess over reviews and look at my reviews. And, and when a book first comes out, I do check Amazon and Goodreads to see whether it's on the right track, whether mm. people hate it or like it. I tend to stick around for the first 10 reviews or so, and then I don't look anymore unless somebody tags me or sends me, you know, the review personally, I, I don't engage with it because not everybody is going to like your work. Um, not everyone is going to try and like, not everyone is going to get what you were trying to achieve with your work. Um, trolls exist. People who are just predisposed not to like you can comment on it. It can all be enormously demoralizing and, and you should, for me, it takes me away from the idea that I write for myself first and foremost. And that is what I do write for, um, for my own joy and my own enjoyment. So criticism in terms of bad reviews, I don't pay any attention to because everybody is entitled to their opinion. And it's not my place to get involved with that. And it's not my place to obsess over that. Uh, if it's criticism or feedback from an editorial perspective, then I'm here for it because I am a new writer. I have a hell of a lot to learn. Um, I'm never going to stop wanting to learn and stop wanting to self-improve and get better on a daily basis. You know, I'm here to be taught, basically. I want that feedback. I want that constructive criticism as much as possible because I think it's the only way you ever become better um, and I was very lucky with White Pines. I had a developmental editor called Dan Hanks, um, who's also a very good writer. And he's got a book coming out, if I'm allowed to plug him. He's got Absolutely. a book coming out from Angry Robot Books. I think it's coming out this year and it's called um, Captain Moxley and the Embers of the Empire, I believe. It sounds amazing. Uh, and it is amazing. Apparently it's a, it's a, a kind of archaeological romp, a fantastical yeah fantasy sort of style <laughs> I, may, I may have completely cocked that up and he's probably going to hate me now um, <laughs> but he's a developmental editor and he went through my book and uh he he's able to give criticism in a way that makes you feel like you're bathing in the warm glow of a, a beam of sunshine he's, <laughs> he's an incredibly optimistic person and he's got a lot of insight um into how to make a story better um so i was Again, I was made a better writer by that entire process and also through um, carefully selected beta readers as well. Um, mm. So I had a beta reader who who read the kind of sixth draft, I think, of White Pines when it was almost finished, but not quite. And his feedback was instrumental in me changing actually quite a couple of um, key plot points and things completely changing them radically changing them so in fact i don't know whether he's read the new version yet or not but he'll notice the changes <laughs> and again it's you know it's all it's all there to help you learn um beta readers can be a, a double-edged sword because some of them can the some of the feedback cannot be as constructive as you would like no but i've never found that i've found that i've only ever grown as a writer because they've they've had a keen eye for something that i've missed or something that i've forgotten about or a loose end or a plot thread that I haven't tied off properly um, or a narrative that doesn't ring true or an inconsistency. Um, I think criticism is, is, you know, uh, in the right, delivered in the right way um, constructively is a brilliant way of molding you into a better person. Um, just in life in general, really. Um, mm -hmm. Although I try not to criticise others too much, because particularly when there are other writers, because I know how bloody hard it is to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the same. I uh, Unfortunately, we are coming a bit short on time. I, I usually ask my guests one final question before I go into the Patreon round, which is, um, why do you write? But I believe we've covered quite a lot of that, unless you've got anything additional that you'd like to add to that question before we move on. Mm, no, I mean, like I said, I write for me. I write because it brings me joy and it keeps my brain healthy. Um, it's therapy and it's it's because I can't not it's not an option for me it's a compulsion um, yeah perfect okay so I've got a question for you from one of my patrons over at www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share um, and it's from Ian J Middleton who says what must read books would you put on a horror writer's reading list oh goodness me that's a massive question <laughs> um, white pines Oh uh, yeah, I would never. I, I'm not very good at <laughs> plugging my own books. I'm good at plugging other people's books. Um, I think the best way of answering that is to go over to Twitter 
and get involved in the indie horror community over there. Um, there are ranks of incredibly talented indie authors who need your eyes on their work. So I'm thinking off the top of my head, people like Gabino Iglesias, um, Keelan Patrick Burke, um, Sina Paleo, um, uh, V Castro, um, Beverly Lee. There's so many, there's so many writers. I could go on and on and on, but there's a, a tight knit community of us. Um, and the stuff that is being written by the kind of horror indie scene at the moment is is amazing and you should thoroughly engage in it um and yeah the easiest way to do that is to to kind of look at the the writing community on twitter and narrow it down to the horror tribe and then just start working your way through all of us because there's a lot of us out there (laughs) and Uh, just just to do a plug for the show as well keelan patrick burke was on this show and was episode 12 for anyone who wants to check out my interview with him back in that was october last year phenomenal writer as well in fact one of his books um is a very short book so if you wanted an entry book for him um his novella sour candy is uh is kind of eldritch and brilliant and uh easy to read and really quite a horrible nasty little book and i loved it to bits so maybe start there yeah totally agree with that okay um so i'm going to finish up with a quick fire round in which i've got 10 questions i'm going to throw at you as quickly as possible uh feel free to say pass at any point it's all just in good fun and they're all completely random so are you ready i'm ready shoot them at me okay what's your favorite horror film oh at the moment it is midsummer one fictional creature you wouldn't want to find hiding beneath your bed probably cujo how many coats do you own <laughs> way too many like <laughs> easily over 20 <laughs> what's, your, what's your favorite hair color my favorite hair color is oh god um brown <laughs> <laughs> would you rather cry ink or bleed marshmallows i'll oh, bleed marshmallows because you could eat them afterwards what are you currently reading what I'm currently reading is uh, about 10 things unsuccessfully, but I am <laughs> the second, I'm rereading the second book of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation um, trilogy, um, the Area X trilogy, sorry. Nice. Or, although he's going to write another one, so it'll be four books soon. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who's someone in horror that doesn't get the credit they deserve? Oh, there's so many of us. Go back to the indie community. The, 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 yeah. We spoke about it before. All of those lovely people deserve way more focus and love and attention than they're getting at the moment. What's your dream holiday destination? (laughs) At the moment, anywhere that isn't my house. (laughs) (laughs) I would settle for the end of the park right now. (laughs) Mm, Same. (laughs) What's one thing from your bucket list that you're desperate to do? Uh, Write a screenplay and see, uh, see one of my works adapted into a movie. What time do you usually go to sleep? Oh, God, way after midnight. Nice. That's 10 questions. One bonus question is where can my listeners find out everything about yourself and all that you're working on? Um, easy enough. Um, just type my name into Google. Um, I, I will come up in a number of different ways. You can find me. You just type Gemma Amore into Google. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Amazon. Um, my books are sold at the moment, primarily through Amazon Well, completely through Amazon. Um, so that's the best place to start beautiful well thank you very much for donating some of your precious time to coming on the show and for anyone who hasn't checked out Gemma's books I do highly recommend them Um, and I'm excited to see where your journey takes you next thank you and thank you for having me it's been fun no worries and thank you everyone for listening and I will see you next week thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast next week I'll be joined by sci-fi king Robert J. Sawyer don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share. Until next time.